Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are recording today from various locations around Winnipeg, all of which are located in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing V by Kim Twee. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, though I'm currently found at the Henderson Library, and I immigrated to Canada with my parents when I was a small child. Across the screen from me is... Hi, my name is Kirsten, and normally you would find me at the Harvey Smith Library, but these days you'll find me at the St. James Library. And my dad immigrated here from Germany after meeting my mom in an Irish youth hostel. And across the screen from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor, and I'm coming to you from the Luriel Library. And uh, my grandparents immigrated from Northern Ireland in the early 1920s because my grandpa, well, aside from the Civil War, did not like being a farmer. He much preferred to sit in the field and read books. And so he came to Winnipeg, and that's what he did. A good book can carry me away from an ever-engine And you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. Your questions and comments are the meticulously prepared meals that fuel our discussions. You can find our email address and all our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. Be sure to stick around for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a minute, Trevor is going to summarize this month's book. But first, Kirsten will give us a bio of the author. Okay. I'm not sure if any of you watched the interview with Kim Twee on, that I posted on our Facebook page, but she is a delight. Kim Twee, born 1968 in Saigon. She left Vietnam with the boat people at the age of 10, and her family ultimately settled in Quebec. But first, they arrived at a refugee camp in Malaysia, where she spent four months before a Canadian delegation selected her parents and her family for refugee status because of their French proficiency. Thuy went on to receive a BA in linguistics and translation and later a law degree. As a lawyer, she returned to Vietnam as one of a group of Canadian experts who advised the Vietnamese government in their transition to democracy. In Montreal, she owned a restaurant called Rue de Nam, where she introduced Montreal to Vietnamese cuisine. And she had that restaurant for five years. And she describes how they only actually served one meal a day, one dish a day, because uh, she was learning to cook as she owned the restaurant. So she she just had one dish that she would serve every day. She started writing short notes while she was working at the restaurant. And at the age of 42, I think, she began writing novels. So she wrote Rue, Man, V, and her latest 2020 book, M. As a parent of an autistic child, she was also a contributor to the book L'Autisme Expliqué aux Non-Autistes, so Autism Explained to Non-Autistic Persons. And in this book, she described her experience with a special mode of communication that she used between her and her son. And she has said that her son has made her very aware of her senses and that without this awareness, she would never have been able to write her first book, Rue, which ended up winning the Governor General's Award for French Language Fiction. In 2017, she wrote Le Secret des Vietnamiennes, which was a cookbook of recipes handed down from her many mothers. She says her father passed on to her the gene of happiness. And she also sees her mission in life as being to slow life down for people in order for us to see all the beauty that surrounds us. She says, if we take the time to stop a little, this is where the extraordinary emerges and reveals itself. And her motto, which I saw her speak about in numerous interviews, her motto is by Dostoevsky, beauty will save the world. 
Like I said, she just seems like she's a delight. She has so many stories, so much experience. So yes, please come over for dinner. <laughs> I would love to host you. Uh, so that is Kim Twee. I'm about to read a uh, synopsis of the novel V, and as you listen to this, you may be struck by how similar the synopsis sounds to the biography that Kirsten just read. But in that interview with Sheila Rogers, Kim says that this book is not based on her life, that her life, it, real life was too boring to write a novel about. So it's actually based on, some of the stories are based on cousins and friends that she's had known and their experiences. So just like any type of fiction, there's some parts of real life that, that she draws on, but we'll talk about that later. So for right now, this is V. The daughter of an enterprising mother and a wealthy, spoiled father who never had to grow up, V was the youngest of their four children and the only girl. They gave her a name that meant precious, tiny one, invisible, destined to be pampered and protected, the family's little treasure. But the Vietnam War destroys life as they've known it. V, along with her mother and brothers, manages to escape, but her father stays behind, leaving a painful void as the rest of the family must make a new life for themselves in Canada. While her family puts down roots, life has different plans for V. Taken under the wing of Ha, a worldly family friend, and Vincent, her diplomat lover, V tests personal boundaries and crosses international ones, letting the winds of life buffet her. From Saigon to Montreal, from Suchu to Boston, to the fall of the Berlin Wall. She is witness to the immensity of geography, the intricate fabric of humanity, the complexity of love, the infinite possibilities before her. Ever the quiet observer, somehow V must find a way to finally take her place in the world. So what were our initial impressions of the book? I had read Rue and Man. So this was definitely on my list to read anyway, even if we weren't doing the, uh, the podcast. And I actually ended up listening to the audiobook of V. And I never really listened to audiobooks. I think the one time that I listened to, uh, I tried to listen to one for this podcast, I didn't like it. But oh my goodness, I loved this book being read to me by Kim Twee. It just transported me. It was beautiful to hear the sentences, the words, the pronunciations of French and Vietnamese uh, through her voice. And that just sort of added to the whole story. And I listened to the audiobook because Sheila Rogers had said in that interview, she said that she had listened to the audiobook and it was so beautiful. And so I was intrigued. And um, it was, you know, I think three hours to listen to it. So it was beautiful to listen to as I was walking or just having a lunch break. Yes. So I really, really enjoy Kim Twee's way of writing. And I just loved this book, I have to say. Before I give my thoughts, I just want to preface them uh, with a comment that I think this is why book clubs are great, because we get to gather together, read the same book. In this case, this book was part of One E-Read Canada. So not only our little book club here, but the Perspectives Book Club, which is another online book club at WPL, and over 300 libraries across Canada are reading this book in January and having similar discussions to us. So just having said that, I think that's great. I'm glad I'm part of a book club that read this book because I don't think I would ever have picked it up in the first place. And knowing I had to talk about it on the, this podcast encouraged me to read the whole thing because I don't think I would have gotten very far in it. I, I was underwhelmed by it. And I guess I could say that I was left wanting more. And this isn't so much maybe a comment on the book, but maybe what my needs were my reading needs were this month where I felt I needed more. And rather than blame a book for not being the thing that I want, it would be like, you know, blaming a cheeseburger for not being a pizza, right? It's not the <laughs> cheeseburger's fault. Uh, I just think I needed something a little different. We can get into that, uh, the details, but that was my take. I, I was not a fan of V. I find myself kind of in between the two of you. Her writing is almost poetic. It's very efficient, and I'm a fan of briefness. Like, I like strunk and white, you know, keep things as simple as possible, cut anything extraneous. And that's one of the questions we asked about, you know, the novel has short chapters and does that make reading easier or more difficult? Generally, I find it something that makes it easier, but the writing style, because it's so pared down, I actually found I wish it had a little more space for me to absorb a lot of the content. 
Uh, we're gonna, I guess we're gonna refer a lot to the interview that Kim Tweed did with, uh, Sheila Rogers because it was very insightful and, and frankly, I found it more interesting than the book. Me too. I was but, so glad to, uh, to listen to that. I, I learned so much about her and, and where she was coming from. I appreciate the book more yeah. after actually listening to that. But. but one of the things she said was that she would write like, a chapter like she'd write several pages and then after several editing passes it would have cut down to like a paragraph and i really felt that it was so dense that every word does have meaning every sentence is something you could reflect on by the time you've read one of those short chapters she's painted so many pictures that you could just meditate on them and absorb a lot more but that's not how i read books i don't <laughs> I don't like read a chapter and then sit there and reflect on everything that it actually means. I kind of, I go through and I absorb it as I'm reading. So I found that I felt like I was missing a lot of things because I, I didn't sit there and sit with it the whole time. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? I, I totally know what you mean because I think I, I'm a very fast reader and that's why I enjoyed it so much as an audiobook because I'm such a fast reader because I am, I, I want to read the story. Well, well, what happens next? And then, and then, and this isn't that type of book. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to, he to hear it being read to me, it, it forced me to slow down my absorption of this, of the story and the words. And what's interesting with that is that it, even though it forced you to slow down, because I looked into the audiobook and now I regret not listening to the audiobook versus reading it. The audiobook is only three hours too. Yeah. So even at a slower kind of pace, it's an afternoon that you can absorb it all. But in comparison to the three hours of Kim Twee reading it, it took me a very long time to get through it. I don't know why. Uh, short chapters usually aren't an issue and the pages are small and there's only text on maybe a little over half to maybe 60% of the page. There's lots of white space around the, the text too. So uh, yeah, it, it was kind of confounding why I didn't, didn't like it more. Yeah, it's. I, I find myself in kind of a medium place. I also like the subject matter, even though I, I don't normally read books about immigrant experiences. But, you know, I, I reflect on my family having immigrated to Canada and our experiences, which were very different than the experiences described here, but they're still very interesting stories, you know? And there are a lot of stories in this book. It's, it's like a, a reminisce. She mentioned in the interview, like she had started with just the character V, but she couldn't really define the character without defining her parents. And then she had to define the grandparents. And then at some point she had to stop because otherwise it would just keep going back to infinity. So it really felt, especially when she was describing her grandparents and parents, it felt like a person sharing stories they had been told about their grandparents. So I thought that was really well done. Yeah. And it really reminded me of, you know, I've been attending a, a, a number of kind of community meetings or webinars and the indigenous way of introducing yourself or identifying yourself. And this really sort of struck me to be so similar in that the who are you is also who do you come from and where do you come from? And she was saying that, yeah, in order to describe V, she had to go back and tell these other stories because that's who we come from. But then she also talked too about this idea of if your grandparents or great grandparents did good things, like there's this chain, right? Did good things and had good luck. Then anytime you would have good luck or good things happen to you, that's because of your ancestors. But the same goes for bad things too. That's because of your grandparents. So yeah, it's almost like you can't tell these stories without going back. And I found that actually very, very interesting as well, because it's a whole culture that I am not incredibly aware of or um, well-versed in. And it's such a contrast too from North American culture where it's very much, I'm a self-made person. I succeeded despite everything. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of the mythos of, especially in the United States, but we carry that here too, where, you know, there are a lot of people who think of themselves as entirely self-made, whereas Vietnamese culture acknowledges that you don't have full claim of the successes you have because it's built on a web of other people. It's yeah. much more collectivist in mindset yes. than the individualist mindset we have here. Yeah, very much about the collective past. And, and I mean, and even with the names, right, we never knew their real last name, because we only know the name that was given to them by the French 
colonizers. And so their real name is lost to them. And, and again, that is so relatable here in Canada and uh, with Indigenous folks and, and language. And yeah. And it sort of makes a, a stark contrast between V and her family, where you get this sense that she is surrounded by a full community of, of support and love, as opposed to, say, her, uh, her boyfriend, Vincent, who sort of comes out of the blue, and you don't really get to know a whole lot about him. And then, spoilers, he disappears. Uh, <laughs> you know, we can talk about the ending later. Those but French. I mean, it's very, very <laughs> stark differences in, in the way the characters are portrayed. Well, I mean, I think that because it's such a short book and there everything is sort of short vignettes, many of the characters don't become very fully developed, right? So that uh, could be, you know, something that's... That's a bit of a negative about the book, perhaps. Yeah. I found it interesting the way she would describe characters, too. Like, when she was describing people that she met, a lot of the descriptions were about what they gave to her in the sense of, you know, oh, this person, they introduced us to music and to food in this place and then to the, you know. And the way that she interacted with others, it was very much about what you gave to others, that was the description of the person. That was kind of the way that people were are thought of in the book is what are you contributing to those around you, which I uh, I saw repeatedly through her description. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was an interesting way to think about what who people are. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sometimes the case of, you know, you describe thoughts versus actions. And uh, I think she even said in her interview with Sheila Rogers, like, in Vietnamese culture, you don't really express your emotions. So... Everything is really about your actions because you don't get to see the inner life very much because people won't share it with you because that's the only thing you have in private. Everything else is exposed, especially when they were in the refugee camps where there's no privacy. Mm -hmm. On the topic of um, the characters, that was one of the most interesting parts I thought of the interview with Sheila Rogers where Kim talked a little bit about her writing process and in particular the character of Ha. Yeah. How when she was writing it, she she saw Ha as just like a a throwaway character that was going to be appearing on a page just for one little thing and then the character got a life of its own and mm-hmm. she couldn't control it. It became a huge part of the story, rivaling even like uh, V's mother as a, as a character. It almost became her story. I just, I just loved that idea that the creative process can get away from the artist and that uh, it goes off in unexpected directions because I was very invested in Ha as soon as she appeared. And then when, you know, she, she was lost leaving Vietnam and then reappearing again, like, it's just like, yeah, I mean, it was amazing. I just, I, I really enjoyed. So again, this is just another comment for those who haven't seen the interview. It's well worth your time to yeah. find the Sheila Rogers interview. It, it's, it's extremely uh, enlightening. Well, and Ha is an example of a character that was really well developed. And, you know, like, mm-hmm. like Kim Twee said, you know, she refused to leave. And I think that I'm always <laughs> so fascinated by writers that talk about the process like that, that mm. it just sort of, like you said, takes on a life of its own. And I'm just. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating way. That must be fascinating to sort of, um, be, be in your head and, and have a character sort of take over your pen. Yeah. Well, and that, that reminds me of an interview I, I read once with Stephen King and he was talking about some fan mail or slash hate mail he got after writing Cujo. <laughs> Cause, uh, spoilers at the end of Cujo, there's like a little boy who, dies mm. and the fan wrote said I, I can't believe you wrote that ending it, it was so dark how dare you uh, kill that boy and then he, he wrote and said well, i didn't kill that boy he, he died while i was writing he oh. said uh, i'm as upset as you are <laughs> oh, yeah. and i thought that was such an interesting idea that yeah. that you know this happened in the story because it had to happen and he didn't know when he started that that's how it was going to end but uh, he was as distraught about the ending as, as the fans so i just again an example of the art going off in different directions Super interesting, yeah. As long as we're talking about that, I I think we probably should tackle the ending now because it's one of those things that really stands out. Like, at the end of the novel, Vincent, her boyfriend, who has become a very important person to her and a very important character, just disappears and you don't find out what happens. And again, in that interview, she actually revealed the ending (laughs) that she had been thinking of. Mm -hmm. And she had written part of it But then she deleted it and left it wide open like that. And I find that a very interesting artistic choice to just say, you know what? 
I'm going to let people figure out what they think should have happened, and I'm just going to leave it there like that. I felt a little kind of abandoned there. I felt cut off, like, okay, this is still a life in progress, but, like, what happened? Like, <laughs> yeah. I know. When I got to the end of the novel, the only thing I could think of was last month when we were talking about Douglas Adams and how he had a deadline and <laughs> the publisher sent someone over to his house to snatch the manuscript up. He had to just finish the page he was working on. And I feel like, well, maybe this did this happen in this case where he, she's working away and then, you know, Penguin uh, just sent somebody over and grabbed the book because I was like, wow, no, I can't. And also her relationship with her, her father is left unresolved as far as, mm-hmm. you know, did they reconcile? Is there anything going on there? Does, does he eventually come to Canada? Uh, yeah. Unsatisfying. Yeah. <laughs> ending? What ending? <laughs> yeah, it was so interesting to hear her talk about how, again, like how the book like ejected her from it. You know, she was thinking about this ending of what happens to Vincent, which I don't, I don't think I would have been satisfied with the ending that she um, came up with actually, but uh, that, that it had a book, very, very Jojo Moyes feel to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But she also talks about, and in in numerous interviews that I've seen her in, uh, she talks about her books being a breath, like a breath. And it's like the breath ended, you know, and that they have this internal rhythm and that's just how it ended. And, you know, it is, it is life in a way too. And I mean, I guess the, the life of a, of a refugee or any, any one of us, you know, we don't always know what's going to come next and it's, it's all difficult and hard and she, but she always seems to find, yeah, the beauty in, in every step. So we can only imagine that V is going to go ahead and maybe see her dad, maybe not, maybe just having that lo- knowledge of him will be enough for her. I didn't mind the ending so much. <laughs> it goes back to that sort of my irrational uh, idea at the beginning where I get uh, mad at something for not being what I want it to be. You know, this is the <laughs> ending that she chose. Yeah. This is the yeah. ending we have. Just because it's not an ending that I feel is very satisfying or complete doesn't make it a bad ending. It's just an ending that doesn't necessarily work for me. But in any case, it worked for you. And I'm mm-hmm. sure, you know, other people take it for what it is. I'm just all sitting there with my arms crossed saying, well, I don't like that. That's not the way I would have read the end of this book. But, you know. I, I will say it's the book, again, had a very much a feel of a reminisce of a person reflecting on their life and all the different ups and downs. And it felt very realistic for that, you know. I mean, V lived – an interesting life. A lot of things happened. And even though, I don't know, the voice of the novel is kind of passive, the character isn't really, even though culturally she's kind of expected to be more passive, but she does so much. Mm-hmm. And she's so involved in lots of different things. So it, it did have very much a real feel of a real life. So yeah, I appreciated she, that. She does go against. Even though I would have. Yeah. And that's that's the other. I think uh, like it, this book deals a lot with the immigrant experience, mm-hmm. the refugee experience, but also just like a general immigrant experience. I, I said at the beginning that I had read Rue as well. And it it also is a very short book, but it like on the page, like it is almost like stream of consciousness almost. And it's a, a book also very similar, similar experience, but I read somewhere that the, the difference is like the, the Rue main character encourages us to move forward and to forget, but V advises us to go back and remember. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. So, um, yes, in that way, then I think very much it's, it's like a story of remembrances and reminiscences. Yeah. But I was struck by how much she did go against her, her mother and her family and, you know, and having these relationships and doing things like even studying translation <laughs> and then being a lawyer and not being a surgeon or, yeah, yeah, slowly coming into I, her own. Yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe that's what I was thinking of when what was really true to life. Like all of the immigrants that I know. They come from different situations and, you know, they come to a new country and uh, often they work very hard. Like my parents worked extremely hard when they came here to establish a life for us. And uh, their kids have varying, you know, levels of success and things that they went for. But culturally, the kids are often very different from the parents and make big changes from cultural traditions, that's often a challenging thing for parents. You know, when you immigrate to a country and you're trying to make a good life for your kids and then your kids do stuff completely different from how you anticipated them doing it. 
So that was a very an, another thing that was very true to life to me when I was reading that. It re- reminded me of my own experiences and uh, of other people that I know. Mm-hmm. Should we talk about the short chapters and because we did get some folks on um, social media that answered that question and um, uh, E. Dot Gishella, <laughs> Eggshella said that they find it easier for sure to read books that is structured with short chapters. Um, it's like fast snippets of characters' lives, especially when books are written from different perspectives. It's neat to follow along. And I thought that was actually kind of interesting because especially coming from, yeah, different life experiences or different cultures to have sort of, uh, I think I can agree with that, that to have these like little snippets, then um, you can then sit and maybe reflect on it a little bit more. Right. Libby said, I prefer short chapters. Ray Redekop uh, said, justifying one more chapter before going to sleep is so much easier, LOL. And that's <laughs> true too, especially right now, I think, you know, life is a bit bananas with uh, just how much is on our plates. And sometimes all that we have really room for is just maybe some short, short chapters. So we've, uh, LSB said, I find short chapters break up the reading experience too much. So yeah, that's another sort of perspective um, for sure. But yeah, actually, most people said, I prefer short chapters. Although then somebody else, uh, Border Regional Library, actually said, I would rather have long descriptive chapters. Short chapters remind me of watching TV, Hmm. which is interesting. (laughs) Yeah, on the short chapter thing, one thing I noticed is that a couple of times I'd pick up the book and I'd read just one chapter and then I'd put it down because I wasn't ready to read more and... I, I, I did feel kind of disconnected from it mm-hmm. as a result of that. Mm-hmm. So maybe the fact that I did do a bunch of short reading spurts didn't help me stay connected to the mm-hmm. book. That could be. On the topic of, of the structure of the, of the book, I found it interesting how on, on almost every page, uh, or maybe it's the beginning of every chapter there, it's given a heading or, uh, that's either, um, a word that's in Vietnamese and then it's, translated to English or it's um, an English word and you have the definition and it, it ties in somehow to to what's being talked about in the text. And I just thought that was a very interesting uh, way to kind of, like you were saying, Dennis, uh, if you, if you, if the chapters are so short and you don't get into the thing and then you get back to it, it almost sort of centers you like, oh, okay, no, this next thing's going to be about, for example, I'm, I've turned to a page where it's white bamboo and then you, you read it, it almost right away is like a orienting your brain to sort of what the story, what is going to be about for the next at least page and page and a half. So what did you guys think of those little headings throughout the book? Oh, I, I guess, I mean, I guess, I, Kirsten, I guess you didn't even have them as an audiobook. No, exactly. Yeah. And they oh. weren't read aloud either. So oh. um, there was just always just sort of a pause. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. 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 There, there are, if you have, if you get a print copy, have a quick flip through. It's quite interesting. And sorry, Dan, so I, what, what did you think of that? Or you said you didn't notice that. I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. So I didn't really connect the word in the title to the chapter at all. So mm. I'm glad you mentioned that because obviously I wasn't paying enough attention. <laughs> well, there. it just goes back to, you know, people read things different ways and some people listen to stories. And I mean, that was something I really kind of enjoyed if you uh, found interesting, but I guess other people uh, don't, didn't, it didn't have any effect on them. So just uh, sailed right over yeah. my head. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> So one of the other things that was very present in the story was gastronomy. She referred a lot to food and cooking and the methods of cooking. What do you think of the use of cooking and food in novels? Yeah, the the words themselves were delicious. And especially when you heard her, like, um, talking of them. And because she speaks French fluently, like, that's really her main language uh, aside from Vietnamese, she speaks English very well as well. But, you know, any of the f- the French words and the Vietnamese, like everything just sounded so delicious as well. And was it in her interview that she talked about that Vietnamese don't always verbalize emotions? Well, yeah, she had talked about that. But that instead of saying, how are you? It's what do you want to eat or have you eaten? So that's such a huge <laughs> thing for, for the culture as well. I love food in my novels 
are in my books. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I'm, I, same. Like, I have often find that the best conversations in life and in books happen around a table with people eating. People are relaxed. If they've had something to drink, they might be a little more uh, honest. So if you can set a scene in a, in a novel with food, I connect to it instantly because I can just sort of put myself in that room around that table tasting the food and uh, especially if it's if it's done well and i think kim Tweed did a beautiful job of just describing all of these things because i i'm sort of a new i guess convert to vietnamese food i'd say i had never had any vietnamese food until about five years ago every once in a while i kind of was like what is that pho stuff and i realized it's pronounced pho <laughs> yeah and then i finally had a bowl of it and oh my god it's so good. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't travel well, though. I, I realize, like if you if you buy it and then bring it home, the meat cooks too much. It's best if you have it in the restaurant and then the meat goes in quite rare, and it just the the broth just cooks it just a tiny bit. It's perfect. So, and so I haven't eaten in a restaurant in almost a year. Uh, so I really, really miss pho, and that's one of the first things I'm going to do when when I when this is all over is to go to a Vietnamese restaurant and have a big old bowl of pho. I totally agree, and I um, but pho is something that I do order for delivery quite often or pick oh, up. Oh, yeah. And the place where I go, they have everything all separated. Oh, so, that's that's the way to do it. Yeah, because I was kind of a bit like, oh, how's this going to be? But they, you know, yeah. they have the the broth separate from the meat from the yeah everything so you get this like huge kind of and then you package and then you put it all together in this huge bowl and i was do you do you, do you want to uh, buzz market this restaurant right now and uh, <laughs> and uh, i definitely well, you know, there's find out there are many many great vietnamese uh restaurants in winnipeg and there i are. think a lot of really great places to order pho. so and i must I have ordered you, from the one terrible order one them it would be the same way that they do it separately so yeah, yeah. I, I guess i i just caught them on a bad day Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. There was that scene in the book where uh, when V's mom was ingratiating herself with the man who would eventually be her husband, there was that description of her making coffee. Yes. And savoring every moment of making the coffee because those were moments where she was near to him. It was a very sensuous scene, mm -hmm. describing everything like even squeezing the tip of the filter just to slow down the drip just a <laughs> bit so she could be there just moments longer, you know? Oh, I found Dennis. That. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Get Ooh, the smelling salts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. <laughs> the description, too, like uh, I'd heard of civet coffee before. I didn't realize it was Vietnamese. I, I wasn't sure exactly where it was, but that was that was a very memorable scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I loved uh, Kim Twee's comments on that scene in the interview with Sheila Rogers. How uh, she said that you know coffee was introduced to Vietnam by the French, the uh, colonialists, and the uh, local people were tasked with picking the beans, but they weren't allowed to drink it. They went, and so mm -hmm. <laughs> they would. <laughs> I don't know if this is was on purpose or or accident. They would they would get the beans that the little civets had eaten and pooped out because I guess they're on the ground as well as I guess picking them from the tree. And and then what would happen though is that I guess the the little civet, which I had to look up what it was, it looks like, almost like a little ferret. It's kind of cute. Uh, it it would eat like the the best beans or whatever, so that it would it would sort of self select the quality, and then its like stomach acid would take away the bitterness of the bean, and and so the result is a very smooth sweet coffee. Which I looked it up, and today it would sell between one hundred and twenty and six hundred dollars a pound wow. if you were to buy it. So. Yeah, it's a very interesting process, but that uh, that's sort of how that began, almost as kind of a byproduct of colonialism. These very, you know, rich, entitled people drinking poop. Well, yeah, and it's interesting, <laughs> some of these delicacies that come from what we would see as being, ooh, gross. Um, like, it, it, I was thinking about on uh, on Facebook, Sophie had uh, written in an answer to this question, she said that she remembers being read to uh, some Enid Blyton books, and there were all these, always these picnics that the kids would have, and they would have all these ginger beer and toffee and tins of tongue that was sort of like a delicacy and just sounded 
So gross. Cause I remember those same books too and thinking, Oh my goodness. But, um, yeah, that was just commonplace. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's funny that that whole, uh, civet coffee thing really, really captured my imagination. Of course it so did. I, I, you know, I did a little, uh, did a little research. I found some other interesting delicacies that maybe aren't. Uh, what you and I would consider great to eat. I'm just going to read out just one now, maybe a couple. We'll see. Mm-hmm. One called, uh, have you got, and let me know if you guys have ever heard of these, because all of these I had never heard of before. So, bird nest soup. Oh. So, mm-hmm. bird nest soup, as the name suggests, is created using nests created by the nests of cave swifts. These specific birds create their nests from their own saliva, which hardens into a sort of a shell. So, when boiled, the nest creates a unique flavor and jelly-like consistency that is quite popular in many parts of Asia, at least among those who can afford it. The nests are one of the most expensive animal products consumed by humans. Just one bowl of soup costs between 30 and 100 American dollars. Wow. Mm -hmm. I've heard of bird nest soup, but I didn't know how it was made, like the saliva. You guys are way more worldly than I am. I just, you know... (laughs) Uh, I'll, just, I'll read one more. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of this corn fungus. You, uh, let me just. So oh. um, it's also called corn smut, which, uh, you know, don't put that into your browser at work. <laughs> uh, it's a fungus that destroys corn crops. Like many indigenous people, early villagers decided to make the most out of a bad situation and ate the fungus that took over their crop. Nowadays, the smut is considered to be quite a delicacy and sometimes costs more than corn itself. Hmm. Um <laughs> So it's very delicious if you get from a good restaurant, uh, and apparently in Mexico, it's it's quite good. It's similar to mushrooms. It yes. has a very nice aroma. Hmm. Hmm. So, Interesting. You know, you know, give me a bowl of corn smut. <laughs> and a side of tongue. Um, <laughs> and a side of tongue. <laughs> um, I, I know we had asked, like, what, what books maybe you enjoy reading that have food in them. And like I said, Sophia talked about these Enid Blyton books, but there, I went through this phase of reading books like Aphrodite by Isabel Allende, which was a memoir of the senses. And it was, it talked about, and then specifically about the sense of smell and taste, obviously. And she has these chapters about aphrodisiacs, of course, and, uh, you know, the orgy, and that could be like just an orgy of like eating as well. And then she's got all these recipes too. And I just, so also similar to, you know, uh, like water for chocolate, like lots of recipes interspersed. But Sounds like a bunch of corn smut to me. I know. And there's, uh, I, I also, another really favorite book of mine was uh, A Natural History of the Senses by Diane Ackerman. And I can't remember if I've talked about this before, where she talks about all these different things that people would do with food in this sort of sensual way. So these, like, maidens would keep uh, an apple under their arm for a very uh, under their in their armpit for a really long long time so it can soak up all their juices and oh yeah that's where the flavor comes from and and perspiration and then when their loved one their their knight would go off to war they would present them <laughs> with this apple so that they would have it and they could smell it and they would just be so close to their lover. That has stuck with me. That and also f- the, the whole chapter on fresh cut grass. Ooh, yeah. Anyway, oh, I can, love I can get those behind books. fresh cut grass for sure. Uh, <laughs> armpit apples. I'm not sure. I guess it depends on whose armpit it's under. Well, yeah, your lover. So then you're yeah. going to yeah, take oh, it. Oh, yeah, I guess so. And yeah. you don't eat it. You just. Oh, you, you sniff it. You sniff <laughs> You sniff it uh, and you have it with you always. Yeah. <laughs> Before we move on, do we have any final comments on the book? Well, she writes originally in French, right? So I always think, too, that when there are these translations that are equally as beautiful. And uh, so I think Sheila Fishman is the, the, is her translator that has done quite a few of her books. And she has won, I think, Governor General's Awards and, and awards for her for her translations. Anyway, I just think it's such an art as well, uh, but I can see why she uses French originally to, uh, I mean, it is such a, she sees French as being the language of love and beauty. And, and, and even then when you're describing sort of the, uh, the atrocities that some of the refugees had to go through, like on the boats and with the pirates and in the refugee camps. And, but she still uses this language of 
love and beauty that really sort of fits in with how she feels that using the language of beauty, you can understand and feel the emotions of the atrocities itself and, uh, and that you can, but that you can also find beauty everywhere. Uh, what did she say? She said, uh, she, she always, tries to find out where the light is. It's not easy. It's not always visible, but it's always there. So, yeah, I thought, uh, yeah, the, 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 the language in which she writes and then the translations as well, I think, is a whole art in itself, too. Yeah, my, my final thoughts are, like, like Dennis, I, too, am a uh, drunken white enthusiast, and I almost always believe that less is more. But in this case, I have to say <laughs> that less was less. <laughs> Even now after our con- conversation? <laughs> well, no, I, I, I've, I, after our conversation and after that interview with her, I have a much better understanding and appreciation for the novel. But right. I stand by my words. Okay. Uh, Fair what, 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 do they call it, what do they call a short novel? Like a novella? Novella. A novelette. Yeah. Novella. This is kind of like a nov. It's so short. <laughs> a nov. yet to reach your monthly Zoom quota? Do you want to expand the types of novels you read? Has your cat stopped responding when you try to talk to them about your latest book? If you answered yes to any of these questions, the Online Perspectives Book Club might be for you. We read and discuss diverse books from authors who write about life experiences similar to their own. Each month brings a new perspective on topics such as genders, abilities, cultures, and more. We meet virtually from 7 to 8 p.m. during the first week of the month. You register for each title separately, so you can pick and choose which months to attend. Space is limited, so sign up on our website today. If you need more information, please email sgeorge at winnipeg.ca. That's S-G-E-O-R-G-E at winnipeg.ca. We hope to see you there. So now we come to our most awkwardly worded segment. Can you tell me a book I would also like? So a book that I think you might also like if you like short books. And this is a recommendation that I haven't actually read yet, but I think you'll like it, (laughs) is Weather by Jenny Offill. So I've, I read her uh, book, Department of Speculation, another very short book. And Weather is also another short book. And like uh, Kim Twee, each sentence, each word is meaningful. And there are lots of sort of short fragmented chapters, short paragraphs, almost like a diary, I guess, is how this has been described with like brief anecdotes. So the story, and I was so excited when it came in. So it's on my to be read uh, pile. The story is about Lizzie, who works works at a university library, but she has this side hustle of answering letters um, and questions that come into the Hell and High Water podcast, which is a podcast about climate change and doom and the end of the world. And it's hosted by her former academic med- mentor. So she answers questions like, how can we save the bees? What will the stores run out of first? And she, she at first sees these letters as being a chance for her to be a, like an amateur disaster psychologist. And, but she soon finds herself immersed in the idea of the world's impending doom and, um, how we live at the end of the world, which we happen to be experiencing right now. But despite all this, we still go on with our daily lives with this impossible hope. We still, build gardens and watch them grow. So um, it's a book I'm really looking forward to reading. And uh, I think if if you liked Kim Twee and, and her way of, of writing, you might like this one too. So that's Weather by Jenny Offill. My book that I would recommend is maybe a bit of a cop-out this month, but as I've said all along this hour, 
V wasn't the book I was looking for. I was wanting more. Uh, and so the book that I'm going to mention and not talk very much about at all is The Island of Sea Women by Lisa C. <laughs> it's a, a book that this very podcast talked about at length a few months ago. So if uh, if you like the idea of a story about relationships during a, a conflict, war over a different times, there isn't so much the immigrant experience with the main characters in that one, but there are characters that immigrate and there's generational issues and lots of things. Uh, I would just recommend reading that uh, Island of Sea Women by Lisa C. And I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. I also didn't have any books that I've read personally that I could really recommend based on this particular title. So I went and used Novelist and found a read-alike that sounds like it would be a good match. And it's And the Mountains Echoed by Khaled Hosseini. Oh, So this uh, story is broken up into shorter stories. It has some immigration experience to it. There's a lot about relationships between siblings. Uh, Afghanistan, 1952. Abdullah and his sister Perry live with their father and stepmother in a small village of Shadba. Their father, Sabur, is constantly in search of work, and they struggle together through poverty and brutal winters. To Abdullah, Pari, as beautiful and sweet-natured as the fairy for which she was named, is everything. More like a parent than a brother, Abdullah will do anything for her, even trading his only pair of shoes for a feather for her treasured collection. Each night they sleep together in their cot, their heads touching, their limbs tangled. One day the siblings journey across the desert to Kabul with their father. Pari and Abdullah have no sense of the fate that awaits them there, for the event which unfolds will tear their lives apart. Crossing generations and continents, moving from Kabul to Paris to San Francisco to the Greek island of Tinos, with profound wisdom, depth, insight, and compassion, Khaled Hosseini writes about the bonds that define us and shape our lives. So That's a good one. uh, Have you read any of Khaled Hosseini's? Unfortunately, no. Mm. I meant to read The Kite Rider back when it was uh, popular, but I did not get to it. So it's still kind of in there in the background yeah. as a possibility, but I have not read yeah. it. Yeah, that might be a good good one to do for a future podcast, actually. Yeah. yeah. The only one of his I read was the, uh, I think it's called A Thousand Splendid Sons. Mm. Uh, that mm. one was excellent, too. Like, mm. but heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. Story, well, you know, but, but well done, obviously. Yeah. Very well written. Yeah. Same with The Kite Runner. Hi, I'm Kira, and I'm the branch head at Transcona Library. I recently finished reading Kane Liggett's The Gracier, which is a fantastic piece of dystopian fiction that reminded me of a mashup of The Handmaid's Tale and The Lord of the Flies. In The Gracier, the society believes that women have terrible and destructive magic. So when girls are 16 years old, they are sent away from their community for a year to release this power. Together, they have to survive being away and on their own, despite all of the dangers that they might encounter. I thought that this was a really fascinating read, and I think you should check it out. So now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, in which our hosts leap down linguistic rabbit holes like intrepid adventurers searching for lost gold. Ooh. <laughs> Low expectations. Yeah, right. um, go for it. Uh, I mean, picking up on Dennis's uh, lost gold uh, reference, my nerd word this uh, month, there's a bit of a story behind it. So maybe just bear with me as I, as I say that this podcast, All Things Going Well, will appear on February 5th, which would just happen to have coincided with my parents' 49th wedding anniversary. If my dad was still alive, and he isn't, he died 30 years ago. So if you do the math, 49 minus 30, they were married for 19 years, which seems like a, a blink of an eye because I've been almost married 19 years. And I, I don't think it feels like 19 years. It feels like maybe maybe a year or something. So I was interested, what do you, what, what's the gift you give on the 49th uh, anniversary? Everyone talks about the 50th. No one talks about the 49th. So mm. one website I went to just copped out and said luxury goods. I don't know what that, that's what, that's, that doesn't make any sense. So other sites say that copper is the traditional gift you give on the 49th uh, anniversary. So my nerd word is copper, not quite mm. gold, but it's copper. And so copper is really widespread 
so this, uh, mineral or metal, sorry, that you can mine out of the ground. The ancient Egyptians used it to disinfect wounds and surgical equipment. And even today, hospitals are experimenting with its antimicrobacterial properties and using copper surfaces and handrails in certain places. So those ancient Egyptians weren't all wrong. And in fact, our own bodies need 1.2 milligrams of copper daily so our enzymes can transfer energy properly to our cells. Uh, there's many uses of copper. It's used in jewelry, gold and silver alloys, uh, wire tubing and piping, of course, because there's good heat and electricity uh, conductors. Uh, it's thin, it's flexible, it's affordable. Uh, sometimes you'll see it in roofing because it's long lasting, has minimal upkeep. Another thing about copper is that even though you use it on its own, it is used best when it's combined with something else as an alloy. So for example, copper mixed with tin becomes bronze. I, I never knew that. And uh, so this podcast, too, is celebrating another anniversary of sorts. Uh, this is about our three-year anniversary yeah. of doing this podcast, starting way back in January or February of 2018. And another thing we're marking is one of our longtime, indeed, founding members of the podcast, Erica, is decided to step back from the library world for a little bit to focus on other things. And uh, so just like Copper, Erica is great on her own, but she makes everything better that she's involved with, including uh, this podcast. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank my parents, because without them, I wouldn't be here. And I'd like to thank Erica, because I feel like without her, this podcast wouldn't be here. So, Copper. Oh, hear, hear. Yes. Hear, hear. Oh, very nicely done. My nerd word is bubble. And even as, as I say that, I'm wondering... Did somebody else already do bubble as a nerd word? But whatever. It's the word that's kind of, yeah, was was in my mind this past uh, few weeks. Kim Twee writes about bubble, the bubble, being in a thought bubble. I think, was that with, with Vincent? Um, sort of a place of security and love and safety to share with someone who, who knows you so well. Um, and of course, right now, there's lots of talk about uh, our bubbles, um, who is in our bubble uh, during this pandemic. Um, now we're allowed to actually have two designated people in our bubble. Um, inside our homes. So the bubble is a precious thing. <laughs> it's a it's a place to be social with loved ones and yet stick to those fundamentals. <laughs> uh, from the Oxford English Dictionary, a uh, bubble is defined as a thin sphere of liquid enclosing air or another gas. It's also used to refer to a good or fortunate situation that is isolated from reality or un unlikely to last. And it's also defined as a place or position that is protected from danger or unpleasant reality. And it comes from perhaps the Middle Dutch bobbel in reference to anything wanting firmness, substance, or permanence. Uh, from the 1590s. So sort of like uh, what uh, what Trevor was saying, I see our podcast team, our podcast crew, uh, but also our podcast readers um, as being this bubble, this bubble of, of preciousness and safety and where we can share things. And, and it's protecting us a little bit from an unpleasant reality, I guess. According to the Urban Dictionary, Bubblies refers to the close knit folks inside a bubble. And so, um, I see us all as being very close knit. And so it is going to be sad to, to be losing, um, Erica, but I know that she will still be one of our bubblies. She will be, um, out there in our, in our podcast land and will be, become one of our, our dear readers. And who knows, she may also, uh, join us again as, a, as a guest, as a guest, uh, here and there. So, so bubble, that is my nerd word this month. Bubbly, bubbly. <laughs> so my word for this month is anticipation. Anticipation is the act of looking forward. In this novel, V's mother had a lot of success anticipating the needs of others, figuring out what they'd need and providing it before they asked. This was instrumental in her wooing of her eventual husband and a foundation of her life. In the interview Kim Tui did for One E-Read Canada, she talked about the importance of finding beauty, even in situations where it was difficult to see, and this reminded me of thoughts I'd had lately on the importance of pleasure, especially when things are difficult. 
I was watching a documentary recently and the people in it were in a bad way. And one of the people in the documentary was very depressed because they couldn't imagine anything good happening to them anymore. They had nothing to look forward to. And with that, they lost any will to live. I've always been impressed with stories of human endurance, like the stories of refugees who endure incredible difficulties to escape a bad situation and go to something where they have a better chance at a good life. It seems to me that we can endure much more when we anticipate that on the other side of our difficulties, there will be something better, a chance at pleasure, beauty, and happiness. Collectively, we've all been experiencing various levels of hardship brought on by the coronavirus pandemic. I know for myself, the major thing carrying me forward is the anticipation that when this is all over, I'll be able to spend time with my loved ones freely again. Anticipation. Oh, beautiful. That's great. Anticipation of the hugs, too. Yes. <laughs> and don't forget the fa. And the fa. Yes. <laughs> So unfortunately, that's all the time we have this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. If you've listened to this podcast for a while, you'll know we're often conflicted about the value of genre labeling. And despite that, we've read and discussed many genres. We've read science fiction, horror fiction, historical fiction, fantasy, more science fiction, mystery fiction, narrative nonfiction, supernatural fiction, magical realism, even more science fiction, and a Western. But despite having three years to do so, we have somehow not read a book in the single most popular genre, romance. So it's time for that to change. For February, we're reading Evie Drake Starts Over by Linda Holmes. If you want to tell us what you think we should read next, connect with us on social media or through email. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all of our past episodes and discussion questions there, too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find Time, time to, to Read. read. For the for the last little while, I felt yeah. a little teary there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's not going to be quite the same. No, no, it's not. But we're still going to pump her for all those book oh recommendations. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's very good at those.